Hey guys, Doug Childs here, little Warriors of Wild Men action with my good buddy, Rich Whitmer. Rich, what's shaking, big dog? What's happening, Doug? Excited to be here, ready to do another awesome episode of Warriors and Wild Men. Man, you ought to see, you ought to see my, my laptop. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's covered in debris. I know most uh, guys' laptops are covered in dried splooge, but bro, I've been doing these charcoals. Uh, in the last couple of afternoons and stuff, just trying to get my charcoal talents uh, back up to scratch and stuff because uh, I've got some commissions coming. And uh, this thing is filthy. I mean, it's just absolutely nasty. You think it'll hurt my computer? Uh, yeah. Zeke said no. He knows more than me. But uh, cleanliness, no, I mean, I, is, <clears throat> cleanliness is next to godliness. That's Proverbs 32. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't look like it's uh, going to help it. And by the way, Shiner Bach, man. Shiner freaking Bach. Safari cigar. We're doing it. You smoking today? Did you bring a stick? I'm uh, drinking coffee. That works. I don't know, man. I'm just getting the fuel. We need we need warriors and wild man coffee, man. Okay, I got and some we hookups. Can, we can do that. No, I got uh, my my buddy uh, Brandon Valerani. He's got Thrasher Coffee. They have uh, they've <laughs> they've got MAGA coffee and uh, Donald Trump 45 uh, double espresso type coffee. They're selling the crap out of well, it. Let's do some and Warriors and Wild Men coffee. Yeah, piece of cake, man. Absolute piece of cake, but it's gotta be the strong stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, uh, yeah, my laptop's nasty. It looks like it's, uh, if I continue this path, brother, it looks like I'm gonna be in for a new laptop. Uh, what, do you, what do you clean it with? Do you just Windex it or how do you get? How do you clean a laptop, huh? Canned air. Canned air. Yep. All it's right. when they take a can and they go like this, and then they sell it to you. Okay. We ought to get in that business too, bro. Yeah, I'm serious. Like de selling dehydrated <laughs> water, you know what I'm saying? Hey, let's, uh, uh, we're groping for topics. We're in between guests and stuff, and uh, it's just me and you today, buddy. And, um, you know, stuff that impacts men, uh, a lot of it uh, doesn't get talked about too much, and... Um, or if it does, it's in the therapeutic realm, and it doesn't make biblical sense, and it's not stuff that makes uh, humans great, and men great, and nation great. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's dropped in our lap to make sense of the world. Now, I guarantee if some psychiatrist or some psychologist hear me talk about depression, they're probably going to laugh their ass off, because I'm not Sigmund Freud. I'm not Carl Jung. I'm not, I'm not some great brain that's able to decide... Uh, dissect the the woes of mankind, but um, I think I've got uh, some biblical skinny on what makes men depressed. Rich, I know you've been uh, dancing around the biblical maypole for what 20, 30 years, and uh, and you've seen what lifts people up out of miry clay when they're in deep woes. So you know we might not have a PhD uh, behind our name, but I got a post hole digger in my backyard. But I think we still got something to offer, man. And not only that, I uh, spent good part of the evening preparing for this, looking up some stuff uh, on WebMD so we can give, you know, that side a little bit of, of perspective. And, and I think that's important. And uh, so just right off the bat, disclaimer, I'm not pretending to be a doctor or know anything about any of that stuff. Like Doug said, I'm, I'm a Bible guy. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. And, but I'm also a person that... I mean, I've worked with a lot of people who've been depressed. And like you said, just through experience and helping people in life, um, I've seen some things that help and I've seen some things that hurt. And newsflash, I happen to be a person. Some people would argue that, but I've been through some things too. And so I, I got something cool that I want to show real fast. See if, I, see if we can get it to show up on the camera. Check this out. It's actually a, a picture, a scan of the brain of a depressed person and a not depressed person or in a depressed state or a not depressed state, doesn't say. But uh, the interesting thing I think about that is that... Well, first, first of all, it's, that's a big-ass difference. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge difference. If I'm, seeing it, if I'm seeing it right through the screen, no, it, man, that's... Wow. Not, hey, literally, night and day, you know what I'm saying? Dark yeah. and light. And so, But we know that how we're thinking and what we're thinking affects the chemistry of our brain. If you're happy... A scan will look different than if you're sad, if you're mad. It, we, we know all of those things. And so one of the things we have to understand is that sometimes we think the problem originates in the brain and then comes out in our emotions in our life. But sometimes it's the other way around. The problem originates in our life, then affects our emotion and affects our brain. And so it's like, which one is causing which? Or 
is it just a cycle that's going back and forth? And so we're not, we're not trying to solve the, the mysteries of the universe about, mm-hmm. about the scientific thing of it. And, and I'm not, look, I'm not against the fact that some people, their, their brain may have issues, you know, they may have problems, but here's the reality. Even doctors, what they're prescribing now, it's based on a theory. We believe that this is happening in the brain and we believe that this medication may and Bottom line, we are giving mind-altering drugs to people who are depressed, okay? Now, also, and I'll say this, I'm not against people using drugs, uh, prescription drugs, to treat depression short-term, but we got to get to the issue so we can move to long-term. You know what I'm saying? I mean, anyway, let me just, I just threw that out there. I know it's kind of a mess, but let's kind of work through it and see what we got, Doug. Because people are dealing with Uh, it, nobody wants to talk about it, especially guys. Yeah, first of all, guys, uh, listen, life's a, uh, life's a bitch. It's not a light beer commercial. Nope. Uh, everything on Instagram and Facebook isn't real. Matter of, <laughs> matter of fact, man, social media, uh, Rich, I would say it's probably, I don't know, 90 to 95% horse shit. Total bullshit. Yeah. I know people on there that they're taking pictures of themselves and they're by like a waterfall or they're on they're on the beach and you know and the girls taking pics of her cleavage and and they're on vacation it looks like they're having the wildest greatest time in their life and I know some of these people that they're pirate hookers that they have histrionic personality disorders yeah that uh, that they're, <laughs> they're hooked on drugs or they're drunk or their lives are absolutely fragmented and shameful and here we are thinking, well, my life's not as exciting as yep. there. So number one, don't, you know, Paul said in what, 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians says you're foolish without wisdom if you compare yourself among yourself. If you think, <laughs> if you think their standard of happiness equates that they're happy, let me let, me let you in on a little uh, insider uh, 411. They're not happy. That's a show, and I yep. saw I've seen people rich come on there, put you know these incredible pictures of their family. They're on vacation. They're down there in the Caribbean, and he kills himself the next week. Yeah. Or the mother, we've reported it on Clash Daily. The mother is sitting there with her children, and they look like they got it made, and they're in North Dallas, and they're shopping, and she murders their whole damn family. Yeah. So. <laughs> When you go on Facebook and Instagram and you purvey people who supposedly have it better than you and that makes you feel whittle and lonely, listen, don't buy into that crap. Yeah. It's not real. None of it's real. Nobody's that happy. And, uh, and, and life is just, it's going to toss you some tough curveballs. And, uh, you know, what I want to do is, uh, with Rich and I is uh, help you field it because well, it's coming. Jesus said storms are going to come right. and they depress people. If you think I'm full of crap, look what's happening in North Carolina right now. They're freaking swimming. And Anderson Cooper's catching big bass with women over there in the floodwaters. So, so, here, here's a thought on that, too. Not just the social media part, but a lot of people, when they go on vacation, they're happy, right? And then they come back to their life and they're not happy. And they think the answer is, if I had enough money to just live on a beach somewhere or if I could do that, I would be happy. And that's not true. And so here's the problem is that, you know, they see people on vacation and think, man, if I could be on vacation, we could be happy. Or a marriage that's having a hard time. And they're like, well, we went on vacation. We got along great. Here's why. You have built a life that you cannot live in. Your whole <laughs> life is built around escaping from the life right. that you can't live in. And so when you get away from it, you're happy because you have no responsibilities. So what happens is we come home and we think, man, the answer is if I was there. No, the answer is fix your life. Build a life that you don't need to escape from. That vacation is is a blessing, man. It's something I yeah. go do and I enjoy it. But you know what? Escapism starts looking at other like other things, Doug, because it, they are some of the symptoms and expression of depression. Escapism doesn't have to happen on vacation. That's how you have yeah, affairs. I agree. That's how people are doing drugs. That's why people become alcoholics. That's why people are, are lost in video games. They get lost in social media. They're escaping from their life, and they're forgetting about the reality that they're in. And that, that really is an expression of depression. And a lot of people wouldn't describe it as being depressed. Yeah, and uh, I got to agree with you, man. Um, not that I've never done the whole uh, escape vacation type stuff, but most of my stuff is hunting. 
which is also business related. Uh, when my wife and I uh, went to Europe several times, we're about to take a trip up to uh, uh, Taos to, to view uh, one of my favorite artists ever in his whole collection that he has there at this uh, museum that they made out of his house. Uh, and again, I'm not, hey, look at me, I've got it made, and you're a dipstick. I go to be educated. I go to do business. Uh, me and you and Zeke and my other brothers and my family and my grandkids, we could sit right on my back porch and watch deer go by and be just as freaking happy as we were as we would be in a museum yeah. or 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 hunting it's a state of mind man That's right. it's not a pl- it's not a place right. i've lived in miami uh, i lived in miami 20 years and that's you know happy uh, happy uh, <laughs> uh, what's ground zero and uh, you won't find more people more women uh, more kids uh, doing mind-altering crap because here they are in the lap of luxury and it's just not paying retail, man. Yeah, and that's the thing, Doug, is that people are trying to escape because they are experiencing some, some type of depression. I'll, I'll read you a definition from WebMD about depression. It's, an, it's natural to feel down sometimes, but if that low mood lingers day after day, it could signal depression. Major depression is an episode of sadness or apathy along with um, other symptoms that last at least two consecutive weeks and is severe enough to interrupt daily activities. Depression is not a sign of weakness or a negative personality. It is a major public health problem and treatable uh, medical condition. And so that's where we saw the PET scans of the brain. And so here's my thought on that, though. Um, It says that it's not uh, a sign of weakness or a negative personality. I, I don't think it's a sign of weakness, but it is the sign of a negative personality because uh, whatever percentage of the population that's melancholic in their temperament, they have th- those people have a way higher percentage of being depressed. And so we can't say that it's not, it doesn't at least have something to do with your temperament or your natural way of thinking, because it absolutely does. Yeah, and if you, uh, you know, if, if you're um, bent and your proclivity is towards uh, moodiness, then become a freaking grunge rocker do something do yeah. become an artist do you know something wrote, positive that's right do because the- that's the flip side <laughs> Doug that's the flip side of that temperament the melancholic temperament is a perfectionist they they're very critical can be very negative hold grudges but the positive side of that is they're very artistic very creative organized detailed <laughs> disciplined but you know what it's like yeah. every temperament every temperament here's- has a destructive part and has the, yeah. the positive part I so agree. you have to harness it but with the te- melancholy temperament you have to understand i have the ability to easily slip this way so you have to be more disciplined you know who was you right. know who was like that doug dietrich bonhoeffer uh-huh. he wrote about it in his book that he was always uh, prone to what he called the darkness And he was talking about depression. And he said Carl Barth was always worried about him and would always talk to him about that. And then when he got thrown into prison and, you know, was was then eventually martyred. Did you know that at that time, Doug, he never experienced any depression? None, not zero. He said he gave his entire life while he was in prison to help and serve the other people that were in the prison. I I think that's incredible. So it it does show. And we're not talking about a weak person. We're talking about as far as I'm concerned, one of my heroes, one of the greatest people that ever lived, but he had, because of his temperament and way of thinking, the, the easily he could slip into depression. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and to me, who's to say that, you know, having that kind of moody vibe about you is a bad thing? Again, if it's productive. I mean, some of, the, <laughs> some of the greatest songs, some of the greatest pieces of artwork uh, came out of the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The Dark Night of the Soul. And that's that's the thing, because, you know, happy people are like, you know, why aren't you happy right now? It's like, oh, I just got through uh, painting uh, The Last Judgment or, um, you know, take like August Rodin. He goes, well, you know, the, the reason I might be moody right now and on my third glass of wine and smoking my seventh cigarette is that I just got through finishing up the centerpiece for the gates of hell called The Thinker which is overlooking everybody descending into the abyss. Wow. If it weren't for that kind of gravitas, if it weren't for the ability to, to deep dive those kind of recess, uh, recesses of the mind and stuff, then we wouldn't have uh, these, these incredible songs. We wouldn't have this incredible artwork. Right. So all you happy, ubulant, effervescent people 
who, who can't uh, go deep and wide, why don't you shut the front door in regards to some of these artistic personalities? They're not problematic. They don't need dope. Everybody's not supposed to be a cheerleader, so leave them the frick alone. And I don't, I don't really categorize that as like depression or a bad thing. And like you said, man, if they do slip there, then uh, we who understand the artistic uh, bent, then, then we take them out and punch them around get them around some people instead of staring at a blank canvas and, and, uh, <laughs> hey, and show them a good time, man. Check it out. One of the things that I was reading about depression, and I'm laughing about it because it sounds funny, but it says one of the triggers or cause of depression, according to WebMD, is uh, loneliness. And it talks about loneliness. And then down below that, it says the solution, make friends. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah, I'm not laughing about it. It's just, it's like, well, that sounds... The problem is this. Here's, the problem Rich, is this. When you're depressed, you don't want to be around anybody. The solution is to open the blinds and get around some people. But what you need is yeah. what you said, Doug, is you need some people to come and get you out of there because a lot of times you get in a place where that's not what you want. The solution sounds simple. Accomplishing the solution isn't as easy as it sounds. Yeah, and um, uh, uh, you, you look at guys, I mean, you bring up Bonhoeffer, I mean, freaking Churchill. I mean, you, you think of Churchill, you know, his wit, his witticism, guy's a ball-busting, Nazi-crushing badass <laughs> who smokes 12 cigars a day, drinks, what, two or three bottles of champagne, just obliterates scotch bottles every day, has the appetite of seven people, and, it, and from all outsider perspective, look like, man, this guy's living large and in charge, and he loves life. He said he went through insane depression, especially before he was appointed the Lord of the Admiralty and stuff, because he's the only one who's seeing uh, Hitler buying these 7,000 airplane uh, motors. Like, huh, that's not for, you know, German airlines. Right. Looks like he's going to start a flipping war. Yep. And everybody's like, oh, you're too harsh, uh, Churchill. And he's like, am I going crazy? And he used to go in his backyard and feed his pigs and talk to himself into a black cloud. Mm -hmm. And he said, he said the thing that got him out of his depressed state, and he wrote a book about it called Painting as a Pastime. He started painting, and he wasn't, he wasn't some old cat. And uh, George W. Bush, when he finally got the blank out of the White House, he picked up uh, Churchill's book, Painting as a Pastime. And because uh, he, was, he, was <laughs> he was like, what the hell just happened those last eight years? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he was, you know, singing the Moody Blues, too. And um, the thing that Churchill said about uh, painting as a pastime and also wall building, he was a bricklayer, too. He'd build these extensive ponds and walls and paint. He said that it didn't make him, it wasn't therapeutic, like, oh, I'm just painting a horsey. He was intense, he was disciplined, and it caused him to use the other side of his noggin that he didn't use for political purposes. It activated this whole another, you know, hemisphere in yep. him that also required thought, discipline, execution, and hard work. So it wasn't just like, let's go paint a, a flipping rose and maybe I'll decompress a couple of notches. It was a complete different discipline that required all of his heart as well, but it took him out of the freak zone of dealing with the negativity that he was getting from Baldwin and Neville, Neville Chamberlain and all the other ass kick, kissers that were switching yep. up uh, Nazi backside. Yeah, that's really good. That, and that's the thing is how do we get the other parts of our brain active so we can get us out of there? But here, here's something it says on Web, WebMD again. It says the primary symptoms of depression are a sad mood and or loss of interest in life. Man, Doug, and you know that a huge percentage of teens are going through this too, right? It says act activities that were once pleasurable lose their appeal. Patients may also be uh, haunted by a sense of guilt or worthlessness, lack of hope, and reoccurring of thoughts of death or suicide. Let, let me throw this out there real quick. Now, this is about this, I'm going to tell a quick story about stress, but I think it applies to this as well. Um, when I was in my early 30s, I had just quit working for a government contractor and went to be a youth pastor making big bucks, man. I was killing it, like $25,000 a year. So, Ooh. yeah, I was re reeling in it, raking it in, man. So um, one day I noticed that there was a like a spot on my head. I was like, what is this? And it's like where my hair was kind of thin. And I was like, ah, I'm going to shave my head because at that time sometimes I would shave my head. So I shaved my head. Doug, there was a perfect bald spot the size of a 50 cent piece right here on the side of my head. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about. Is that, that uh, is that a, a pisha or yep. what do they call that? So I freaked out. I was, went to the dermatologist, had a hat on and said, yeah, I need to see a doctor. We can get you in next week. I said, oh no, no, no. We're going to get me in today. 
And she goes, no, sir. And I took my hat off. I said, look at this. And she literally goes, okay, we'll fit you in. And I, and the, and the devil told me, see, it's a brain tumor. You're going to die. So of course I freaked out, you know? So I went and sat down. I waited. I go in there. The doctor looks at it and he goes, oh, that's alopecia areata. And he starts writing it down. And I'm like, well, what is that? And he goes, well, that's Latin. It means an area of hair loss. And I said, you're not, no al- you're not allowed to charge me money <laughs> for me to write down area of hair loss and then have you right. say it back to me in Latin. And he laughed and he says, well, it's, it's caused by stress. And I said, but I'm not stressed. And he looked right at me, Doug, and he goes, okay. And he right. laughed and I was like, what's that supposed to mean? He said, that's what well, alcoholics he said, say. Well, you can say you're not stressed, but your hair but your damn hair's has clearly falling out. Falling out. And he goes, now we'll get um, some steroid topical cream that should help. And he goes, but you need to know something. If you don't get the stress under control, this probably is not going to happen, but it will spread. And you could lose all of the hair on your entire body, including your eyebrows, your eyelash. And I was like, whoa, whoa, hey, then whoa, you, whoa. Rich then, Rich, then you'd look like Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> so check it out. After that, I got a spot on my neck. Wow. It started, and I was like, I got to get myself under control. So the problem was... That ministry, that ministry will kill you, man. Well, and then the problem is this, though. <laughs> they said, you're stressed. And in my mind, I had an idea of what stress was. And I didn't feel like those things. So in my mind, I wasn't stressed. With depression, yeah. people sometimes, they think, you're depressed. No, I'm not. Because we have this idea of what we think depression is, and, right. we, and we miss it. And, and depression's normal, and, and this isn't from WebMD, it's from just me, whatever, reading, but depression is a normal thing that we do experience that is a normal, healthy response to, like you said, some of the things that happen in life. Look, when somebody you, you love dies, you are depressed. You will go into depression. It's not going to be one day or two days. Right. It could be weeks, like this says weeks, right? But it's not normal for you to stay there after a period yeah. of grieving. You should climb out. Some things yeah. happen in life, they cause shorter term depression. It's when you're hanging around down there too long that we would say, you know, we probably have some type of problem that, that we have to deal with. So I think one is just recognizing that it's possible that you're depressed. Yeah, Zeke, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Rich, um, uh, the Son of God was depressed. Yep. And uh, <laughs> God forsook him as he placed the world's sin on him, you know, went to the cross. Uh, the Apostle Paul, I mean, talk about a melancholy cat. Yeah. I mean, you, anybody who reads uh, Romans 7, anybody who reads between the lines uh, in his intros, especially to his various letters to the churches, uh, that cat understood what he did. And uh, he felt a profound sense of, of grief and thanksgiving for what God did uh, to him, the guy who murdered Christians. Yep. So there's so when we're talking about you know you, you can't be depressed there is just like uh, you know Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount first podcast you're gonna face storms man and uh, you know again going back to what just happened with uh, Hurricane Flo over there in North Carolina uh, these people I guarantee you, a lot of them are mentally sound and stable but their life just got freaking oh, yeah. jacked up and so they're sad. I mean, it, uh, again, I know it's material and it's temporal and stuff, but that's their stuff. And it just went floating down the Chattahoochee Canal, you know, in storm surge. Yeah, and, you, and your home, that's more than just your stuff. That's, yeah, that's, your, that's nest, your base, baby. man. That's your sanctuary. Yeah, yeah so, um, so we're, we're not, uh, I, I've never purported to be the shiny, happy uh, person 24-7. And let me, uh, Rich, let me, um, let me turn a corner here for uh, some of these people who, um, who are fighting depression. And uh, some people out there, uh, brother, <laughs> they need to be depressed because their life blows and they've made horrible decisions. And some of that depression, some of that feel bad that you're experiencing, some of that moody blues uh, that you're going through could be the hot breath of the Holy Spirit convicting you for being a rebel without a clue. Hey. And I'm telling you, man, when uh, right before I got converted, brother, uh, I didn't care about vagina anymore. I really didn't care about fast cars. I was so into drugs and smoking weed and just being a depressive, sad sack that worked at a, at a gas station. And all of it, the depression, uh, the moodiness, the weirdness, the isolation, except for me and my drug buddies, intensified until December 7th, 1983, where I said, man, I hope all the stuff they've told me about Jesus is real because I'm sick of this life that I'm living. And boom, man, 
uh, the, the, the bomb doors on the Enola Gay that the Holy Spirit was piloting dropped a big nuke on my head and I got right. converted. And you know what? Uh, depression, conviction, and guilt preceded all that. And to moi, that was a damn good thing it did because I would have never considered Christ if my pain hadn't got insanely depressive and intense. No, that's so. right. You know, that's great because I, I was talking to my son, Luke, and uh, his school, Queen Creek High School in Queen Creek, Arizona, just uh, east of Phoenix, Doug, they, I think they had five or six suicides in the last year. Uh, two of them were students who had graduated. That's huge. It, it's yeah. even percentage wise, everything. They're like, we have a problem, right? Obviously the problem is not with the school, the schools, nobody's <clears throat> thinking the school is doing something, but something is happening. Right? So I talked to my son about that and, and he's, he's 15. And, and I said, son, you have to understand that there are things in life that make you sad. You know, divorce makes kids sad. Um, you know, siblings being on drugs, different things make people sad, not doing good in school makes you sad. You, you feel bad about that. So what do you do? Like we were saying, you escape, you try to get away from it. And I said, and, and what do kids do when they're bummed out and they want to be happy? And my son said, oh, they want to drink, do drugs and sleep with girls. I said, okay. So drinking alcohol is a depressant. He's like, yeah. yeah. I said, it makes you forget for a little while and then you get sober and now it's worse. I said, weed is a depressant. It makes you forget, and a little while later, it's worse. I said, now, Coke, that's a different story, but you end up strung out stealing things, and you don't want to do that, and you can't afford it. It's a lot of money. Not that I've ever done it, but that's what I've heard, and that's fact. Full disclosure, never did Coke. So we started talking about that, and I said, and then girls, man, you get a girlfriend, and all of a sudden you're in love, and you know, dopamine's firing in your brain. You don't need drugs at that point. You've got a new drug, right? I said, then you're all in love with this girl. You're all excited. Everything's great. Everything's wonderful, and then you have sex with her. And I said, and here's what happens. Guilt sets in. It, and I said, then you realize, then you realize uh, you're no good at it. And then you feel shame. Because yeah, then the shame like, comes. Yeah, but the reality <laughs> you is. You look I said, like the hurdy-gurdy man, you that, know, humping a horse. The, our something. whole society can say that it's okay, that it's right. But then you go home and you're by yourself and you know it's not right. And then well, guilt sets another, in. And then depression becomes this cycle. And so what do we do? They keep drinking. They try to stay high. They keep running yeah. around with people, trying to make that stop. And the next thing you know, man, they are a car accident emotionally. Yeah, here's, here's another thing to consider uh, those who are, uh, are going to go out there and bump uglies is that, um, you know, what else is depressing too? Again, you know, I'm not going to, listen, sex is great, God's idea, you know, in the confines of holy matrimony, guilt-free, knock yourself out do costumes on Thursday, whatever floats your boat, man, <laughs> go for it. But um, here's something that, uh, that they, don't, they don't really tell you too often. Definitely El Diablo doesn't tell you this when he's tempting you to use the superfluity or imbibe deeply rather into the superfluity of naughtiness is that, you know what's depressing? To have a half dollar size uh, open festering sore on the tip of your dick, that's depressing. <laughs> Wouldn't you think so? Or or your uh, <laughs> or your vagina or your vagina walls? Yeah, that's depressing. And uh, the STDs that just go through the and, and here's what's funny, Rich. Even with the STD stuff, and this stuff is exploding. If you watch television, it's like, do you have herpes? Do you have chlamydia or gonorrhea? We'll take you know what uh, asper cream or. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever the heck that they're hawking. And they show people riding horses on beach, you know, that have herpes. And, you know, they take this drug that has the side effects of, you know, heart attack, suicide, hair loss, depression, all this other stuff. And it's all because we couldn't control our appetites. And like Solomon said, he goes, listen, you think you're going to get a, a great buzz off uh, imbibing deeply into, uh, in, into these um, fleshly appetites. He said, put a knife to your throat instead mm -hmm. of indulge your appetites. And Christ said the same thing, man. He said, yeah. don't go there because it'll promise you the moon in New York City, just like a, a bait that I've put out for a sailfish, prob <laughs> promise them a, a hearty breakfast or a nice lunch or a, or, you know, a sweet evening you know, pre-darkness dinner. The thing that they don't understand is that there's a flipping big-ass number six circle hook 
hiding in that pilchard waiting for them yep. that is more depressing <laughs> well, that's than the problem. anything that they ever eat in the ocean. That's the problem, though, is that the things that people are using to escape depression actually come back and cause guilt, condemnation, shame, which increases the depression. It's a, it's a wicked cycle, right? And obviously, we're not, we're not trying to simplify it that everybody that's depressed is because of those things, but these are definitely some things that cause depression or can make depression worse. Sometimes yeah. that's where it originates. Like you said, sometimes it's, I'm not living right, I feel guilty, now I'm depressed. That's, that's a real factor, man. Yeah, and, um, and um, you know, as far as I can deduce, and, and the good thing about what you just said, Rich, is that um, you know, because it's you or me, who's causing uh, (laughs) the bad feelings, the depression, the guilt, and the condemnation. Well, you know, the upshot about that is that, is that there's something that I can do there. There's something, you know, I can do about me. Yeah. I can't do, I can't do squat to my, say your parents are completely bad crap crazy. All right. Say that's just nothing but constant fighting and squabbling and, uh, total dysfunction junction at your house. Uh, Promise yourself, young person, uh, that you're not going to uh, pass on that curse. Promise yourself that you're going to rise above the tide, that you're not going to fold like a cheap lawn chair and become part of the wasted youth and, oh, look at me, poor pitiful me, that you're going to have a better marriage, you're going to become a better person. You're going to do the antithesis of what they're doing in their uh, self-destructive lifestyle. Just because you're in a bad, untoward environment doesn't mean that you have to perpetuate, or, or uh, what's the word? Yeah. No, that's not the word I'm looking for, Rich. I'm not losing my mind, just a memory. You don't have to continue that curse in your uh, life cycle. Yep. You can change things. Uh, and again, I'm not diminishing you know, what people are going through. And uh, my wife, when she was a teacher, brother, you talk about uh, dealing with some jacked up kids, low income school, West Broward County, most of them, one parent home. Most of them, the whoever was watching them didn't give a freaking rat's ass about them. Most of them, it was just a sweet old grandmother that was doing it. And it was Thunderdome, man. And she parented hundreds of kids, if not thousands, over a 17-year time period, trying to tell them, listen, you don't have to live like this. You don't have to be like that. It sucks that your parents suck, but you can stop that right now. A lot of them uh, graduated, went on to college saw them throughout the years when we lived in South Florida have great lives where, you know, if you get some teacher, some person who doesn't give, give a crap, and they're punching a clock and cashing checks, they would probably, again, extend that curse, you know, strongly in the next generation. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And, and here's, a, here's another thing, too. Um, some of the people, they don't choose depression or they might end up depressed and not know what to do. Uh, like sometimes they barely figure out that they have depression. But let's read some of the physical symptoms from Web, WebMD because, again, I think some people, they might not understand what, what people are going through. Another thing, too, Doug, is that I don't think we're as compassionate as we could be to people who are depressed and we're like, get up and do something about it. Well, they, they don't have the energy or the motiva- motivation. They really do need other people around them to help them. You know what I mean? That's a reality. So uh, here's some symptoms, physical symptoms. Um, fatigue and decreased energy, insomnia, um, excessive sleep. I, I think, you, you know what's funny is, I know it's funny those two things, but here, here's the you thing. You can't sleep. You sleep too much. Yeah, you can't sleep. You can't sleep, you sleep too much. It's like the, the um, agnostic, so, dyslexic, um, right. what is it, uh, agnostic? Doesn't believe, in go- doesn't believe in dogs. Yeah. It's not, oh, insomniac. That's a it's dyslexic agnostic insomniac who lays awake at night wondering if there is a dog. So anyway, um, but, but I think a lot of this generation, the younger generation, especially they love to sleep and, and they do that on their day off. They, it's my day off. I'm going to sleep. I love to sleep. And then I say, you got to get a hobby. My hobby's sleeping. You know, you know what? Your life is marked by depression because it's not normal to want to sleep. I, I know families, Doug, that literally like on a Saturday, the whole family, parents, all the kids, everybody would sleep until noon or one o'clock. You got to be freaking kidding me. You know, I, I had my uh, <clears throat> I had my delicious uh, grandkids over here uh, for a full day a couple of weeks ago. And um, so they get up early, which is I'm not an I'm not an <laughs> I'm not an early bird, man. 
Uh, I stay up late and uh, I get up late, but you know, boom, crack of dawn, man. They're like, let's play. And I'm like, yeah, I gotta get, a, I gotta get like a gallon of coffee in me before I'm ready for your jacked up noise and stuff. And so like around 11 o'clock, you know, they just conk out and they take like, you know, two, four hour nap. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, how can you sleep like that? You have no bills to pay. That's how you can sleep <laughs> like that. You had zero bills to no pay. No depression. And, um, yeah. <laughs> So what's uh so what is uh does WebMD uh, give the skinny on what's normative uh, amounts of sleep seven hours? Eight no, it hours, doesn't. But they're they're three? they're saying that six to eight hours, and they're saying um, no one needs. And th- I read this. I don't remember where I read it. You can look it up. I didn't write it down and then read it. I actually read it on a credible medical site, and they said that um, I read it on the internet. Yeah, I wrote it down and then I read it. <laughs> so they said anything after eight hours is not good for you, unless you're old, really young. Or sick. You know, you know what I mean? Uh, so, I mean, know, if you, you know have a problem. Weird? You know what's weird? And I don't know if she's got depression uh, problems. She doesn't look like it because she's a full-on smoke show, man. Halle Berry, they asked her, they're like, Halle, you know, what's your secret, you know, to, to looking beautiful and uh, uh, at 52 or 53? And she's like, well, first of all, I eat right. Uh, I don't hang out in the sun. <laughs> um, uh, also hit the pick six of the genetic lotto, so that helps. And um, she said, you know what, no matter where I'm at, I try to get 10 to 12 hours of sleep a day. It's not worth it. I'd, I'd rather right. look like to me. me. That's, I'm not that's wasting a, my life. You know what? You can look yeah, good and miss lot. half your life. Nah, pass. Halle Berry, you're lazy. Get right. your lazy butt out of That's bull crap. That is not <laughs> medically accurate. That's a rich hey, person look, she also, who lays around. Yeah, I, I, no, yeah, I don't go she for also, that. She also has like 20 people to take care of all of her crap and her uh, kids and everything. And, and, and I, I also and, Halle right, Berry I fan. An entourage. I think she's beautiful. I don't go for that crap. Ain't nobody sleeping 12 hours unless you're sick or you're almost dead and you're just practicing. I don't know, man. I, I ain't sleeping no 12 hours for nobody. Hey, Rich. Let's um. Anyway, uh, so yeah, let's move. Let's move on real quick to a couple of these things. Um, hit me. So depression can make other health problems. Uh, persistent aches and pains, headaches, cramps, digestive problems that don't ease with treatment because we know that you know most diseases are psychosomatic anyway which means they originate in your brain in the way that you think and so obviously if you're depressed it's going to cause physical pain different problems in your body but here's another thing depression also goes the other way because pain causes depression chronic pain constant pain also causes depression so it's also again a wicked cycle right and we don't know which one's causing which a lot of times i don't you know um from a biblical standpoint, from a Texan standpoint, which uh, oft times th- those twain get confused, um, I don't know if I I don't know if I completely believe that because um, I've I've watched people, uh, Purple Heart recipients, uh, live through freaking brutal pain, and some of them are some of the most positive freaking energetic people. Yeah, that but I've that's ever met but what did you life. say? They're what are they? They're positive. Yeah. One of the things the article talks about is that positive thinking, because it's a, I saw, I read another thing too, is on um, facts and myths. And somebody said that positive thinking can help with depression. And you, a lot of people are going to think Hello. that's a myth. And it says fact. <laughs> no, because it is. Absolutely it is. Yeah. Those guys have mindset because some people have a better mindset. And again, we're, well, that's, that's where, to me, that's where um, uh, that I'm, and I know you pastor the same way. I used to do the same thing uh, when I was in the ministry. Dude, I was rough on... Uh, if I knew somebody was milking some kind of malady, whether real or imagined, and they were going to live off uh, you know, the pity of the people of God ad infinitum, uh, I, I stuck my head down and hit him right in the solar plex. Because, man, you look at Job. Job had his family taken from him. He had his health yep. taken from him. Didn't do, he didn't do anything to deserve it. It was just a bet between God and Satan. And uh, Satan's like, hey, man, he, he worships you because you give him all this stuff. Take right. away the stuff, we'll see what happens. And God's like, all right, let's roll. Pulled his hedge down and, and waylaid him, man. Lost everything. North Carolina hurricane flow, gone. All of his kids, gone. Livelihood, gone. And Job, uh, he, he had Christians telling him that uh, <laughs> it's your fault trying to add to his confusion and depression, his wife telling him to curse God and die, and uh, Job didn't uh, lose his integrity 
and he worshiped. And here's what I tell people is like, listen, when, when the stuff is overwhelming, uh, whether it's physical or, or psychological, and you know the source isn't you or Satan, and that's, that's a big test. You got to discern whether you're yep. bringing on all your bad crap. Is this a demonic attack? If it's you, then you need to change. You need to repent. You need a mind alter that doesn't come from LSD or that's marijuana. Right. Or from whatever uh, they're giving you down at the doctor's office. If it's Satan dumping a load of guilt and condemnation and you've closed with Christ and your sins are forgiven and you've made amends to people, then you know, or if he's attacking you uh, from a business standpoint or, or, or a gospel standpoint, then you just need to fight back. You don't roll over in the fetal position and curl up the big, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, in the corner and suck your big thumb, man. That's not what you do. You fight back. If it's God, like it was with Job, then you worship. So you either take responsibility if it's you, uh, if it's Satan, you fight back. You don't believe his crap. Uh, God's not finished with you. He's the fat lady, and he hadn't sung on your life yet. He doesn't even know how to sing yet because he's got hopes and promises for you. And uh, thirdly, if it's God, if it's mysterious, if it's unmistakable, uh, and you know it's not uh, a direct cause and effect by your bad decisions, then just worship. Yeah. I heard, you know, this is what, uh, and I don't know that there's any kind of biblical... Um, uh, uh, proof text for it, but somebody, some Hebrew scholar said that Joe's crap only lasted a year and a half. When we read it, I'm thinking this is going on and on and on and on and on. And my point that, uh, whether it's true or not, the thing that I found interesting is that you think that you're stuck in some, you know, irretractable moment. This could be just a year, man. Sometimes it could be five years. Mm -hmm. Who knows? But the whole thing is that if this is divine darkness, not satanic or personal, then just worship. Just don't don't become don't renounce your faith and become bi curious and join a uh, anti theistic improv group. Just worship. Yeah. Just give it back to the Lord and don't vie into uh, the melancholy that He's forsaken you because He hadn't. That's right. And all things work together for the good. That good doesn't mean easy. It means it might be an internal good. Doesn't mean good ease. But even though uh, we know in uh, Job that God restored back to him, what, uh, four times, twice? Yeah, I can't seven, remember how much, but like he, he restored more than what he had. Yeah. You know, and, and so that's, huge, that's good, man. Doug. I, and that's one of the things they said, too, that helps with depression is hope that things can change. Because just what you said, I think sometimes we think this is how it's always going to be, and that's not true. And, th and let, me throw, let me throw this in there. Um, I'm, I'm not a big proponent of medication to help with depression. And, and the reason is, is that the second you go to the doctor and say, hey man, I'm feeling kind of down, they'll give you drugs. And, and I don't like that. And, and a, a leading psychologist no. in America said that America <clears throat> is over-medicated and what people need is a 20 minute walk every day. And we could talk about that on yep. the next episode. Absolutely. But my thought is this sometimes, and I've seen people personally that have been so deep down in the pit that medications used with other people coming around and helping them to get them up out of that because they're at a point that they're not able to put on their right thinking. Like they're really deep. And, and I've seen people use medication to get up out of that and then get off the medication and go on to live their life with better thinking. And so, you know, I, I probably when I was younger and everything, I had the answer to everything. I was pretty anti medication for that type of thing. But now having seen some people uh, use it effectively to get out of a really deep, dark place. I, I think there's a place for that, but it will never take away the need for worship, for prayer, for hope that things can change, faith, and that's what faith is, people around you to help you. Those are things that have to happen. I, th I think on the, on the next episode, we could probably talk about some of the ways to get out of depression, focus on, I mean, we talked about it. It's a real thing, men deal with it. So Doug, um, on, on this uh, episode, we talked about a lot of the causes, and, and it may seem a little rough, but uh, we weren't able to cover the whole topic in this first one, and, so, and, and I really like the stuff you had to say about hope in the second one. So people really need to listen to the, the second part of this podcast. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah. Part one and part two, man. And most part twos, uh, suck worse than an uh, airplane toilet. We're talking about, uh, movies and stuff, but, um, yeah, stay tuned for part two. Part one is, uh, the diagnosis and it's, uh, it yeah. can be bleak. And part two is the, the hope sickle. Yeah. yeah part two and is the, it, the part that shows you what you can do to get out of that. So I think it's yeah. important. It's and it's delicious, man. All right, warriors and wild men. 
Uh, make sure you go to our, our podcast. You like us, love us, rate us, review us, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, Twitter. And don't forget to get your Warriors and Wild Men man card. It doesn't make you a man, but it lets people know that you're serious about being one. Warriors and Wild Men. <laughs>